Well, hey, good morning. Happy Easter. I'm glad you all took a minute to come out today and uh, hang out with us. Thank you for those who are joining us online. We're going to watch it at another time. Um, man, today is a day to celebrate. Awesome song, uh, Kelly. Love, the, love just the concept of that, that, that God brings death uh, or brings life back from death, right? And I, what I love is I get to see that on a consistent basis. Um, I get the opportunity to see people recover their life back to what it is that God intended it to be. And uh, that's true for every person in the room today, to be honest, right? Like that's what we're here to celebrate is that's what God did for us. Um, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the cross, that, that he forgave all of my sins. I'm thankful that he just didn't die, but he rose from the dead. I'm most thankful that he defeated sin once and for all, right? I think sometimes we don't catch the concept of that. Many of us are striving still to try and be a good person. Do you understand that if you are in Christ, sin is defeated? It no longer has a hold on you. It doesn't have any authority or power over you. Now, real talk, though. I'm still trying to get this to line up with the truth that God spoke about me. You understand what I'm talking about? That's why I still struggle. It's not that sin gets to hold me any longer. It's been broken, right? According to Jesus, sin has been canceled once and for all. That's the sin I did yesterday, the sin I'm going to do today, and the sin I'll even do tomorrow. See, But that's who Christ is, and that's what he is all about, is coming in to break that off of us. And I'm thankful for all of that. But today... I'm going to mix it up a little bit because, you know, we've, we're in this series right now where we're going through the entire book of Luke. And I'm only in chapter five. So it's not to the end of the book that you get to the story that we're celebrating today. So instead of, you know, like, OK, so you might be here today and you're what I would call a creaster. Anybody know what a creaster is? You only come on Christmas and Easter. And I'm glad you're here. Don't get it twisted. I'm happy that you came today. Thank you for coming. OK. <laughs> But think about it. Every Christmas, every Easter, you hear the same story. So I get to mix it up for you today and tell you a story you probably have never heard before because everybody always preaches the same sermon. So you probably will like it. Um, or you might have just got offended because I called you a creaster. Let's get to know each other for a minute. I'm that pastor, okay? Everybody else thinks it, but I will probably still say it. Um, and again, man, for real, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you took the time to come. It is my hope today that when today is all said and done, you have an opportunity to see who Jesus really is. Because I'm going to be straight with you. It is not what Jesus did at the end of his life why I follow him. It is how he lived. See, because, and that's what I'm going to get in today. I'm going to tell you a story today about an encounter he had with a man. And the reason I trust Jesus is because this book is full of stories of how he dealt with people like myself who are often complicated and struggle. And his faithfulness with people like that lets me believe he could work with somebody like me. You understand what I'm talking about? So today, that's what I'm going to get into. That's the story that I'm going to tell you because that's where we're at in our series. And we are not going to get far. I think we'll get about five or six verses. And then I'm going to rehash it a little bit next week because I don't have enough time to tell you everything I want to tell you, and I don't want to keep you here till one o'clock. So uh, my wife's like, amen. So, so as we get into this day, here's the thing. A couple things as we get to know each other, especially if it's your first time. Um, one, I am not here to tell you what to think. I'm not here to tell you this is what you should believe. I'm right, you're wrong, anything like that. I am here to challenge you to think. That's my problem with most people is I don't think people think anymore. I think they'll listen to what anybody says, and especially if you're charismatic and you can get all excited, like they'll be like, they'll listen even more intently until somebody else comes along who can talk better than you. But the whole purpose, and the Bible even talks about this, you're supposed to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is not my job to feed you something, right? It is your job to listen, to think about these things, and, and to, to challenge your own ways of thinking and thoughts, like maybe there's something to this. So now, here's the first challenge I want to present, is I don't believe that the church's salvation mes message or approach to salvation and Jesus' message may not be completely the same. Think about this for a minute. Like, Often the church has leveraged a fear and fatalist mindset that if I'm bad and I don't try really hard to be good, when it's all said and done, I'm going to the hot place when I die. 
So what do I need to do? I need to repent. I need to ask Jesus to forgive me, come into my heart, so I get my get out of hell free card. And then I need to strive the rest of my life trying to be a good person. Has anybody ever heard that message before? Anybody ever chased the proverbial carrot when it comes to religion? Come on, talk to me a little bit this morning, somebody. Okay, right. I don't believe that was Jesus' message. And I'm going to prove it this morning with the way he called somebody to follow him. Because he didn't lead with that. He didn't lead with moral behavior. He didn't lead with behavior modification. He didn't lead with sign up, go to a class, get your act right, and then you can ride with me. He led a completely different way. I don't believe that was Jesus. And so I challenge you this morning to consider the contrast between the way Jesus does it and the way often the church has done it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, maybe it's the way you think people ought to do it. But I believe that Jesus is smarter than all of us in the room. And if we're smart, we'll follow him instead of what we think is right or what, what our preacher said. So um, we're going to be looking at, again in the book of Luke. Now, just to give you a little background, I like this book. Um, now, when you talk about the apostle Luke or the, the disciple Luke, first off, he was not an actual 12 disciple of Jesus. He did not walk with Jesus. He was not there when Jesus died. He was not there to see Jesus' miracles. Luke was a, a disciple, actually, of the Apostle Paul. Now, here's why this matters. Because Luke, actually, as he writes this book, he's more now like an investigative journalist. His background was a doctor. So he's really intent on details. So his background is a doctor, and he's on assignment as an investigative journalist for this guy by the name of Theophilus, who most likely is a Roman official who came to faith and now is struggling with doubt. We don't talk about that much in the church. But the, rea the honest reality is we all doubt. We all struggle sometimes believing what we say we believe. Right? And you're like, no, not me. I fully believe it 100% all the time. God bless you. But there are days I will sit in my office going, for real? Is this real? Right. Because sometimes if something sounds too good to be true, I've always been taught it is. And there's a lot of goodness in this that's hard for me to believe that somebody would love me with no strings attached, that I don't have to do anything to receive that love is hard for me sometimes to comprehend. That these fantastical stories that I read about, that they really happen and that people really live this way and that God really did some of these things. Sometimes there's a bit of a struggle in really embracing all of that. It often brings me back to the place where what I look at is how my life has changed. The man that I was, the man that I should be because of the environment that I came out of, and the man I am today. Now, you can't argue me out that. Because like that song says, like a dead man has walked again. Right? Like, like God has brought resurrection in my life when there was only death. That's why I am fully sold out. But I'm telling you, there's times we're going to struggle. There's times that you're going to go through situations and seasons where you're going to go through hard stuff. Look, when we, we were just kind of reminiscing this morning because it was last Easter that I knew my wife had cancer and none of y'all did because we weren't ready to tell. I remember getting up here and trying to preach an Easter message. I don't even remember what I preached. I don't remember much from the day except I hid in my office and I dipped out as fast as I could when it was over. And I'm telling you, it wasn't easy. And it wasn't that I doubted God because I have a lack of faith. It is actually because of my faith that I was struggling. Because I believe that God is good. I believe God has good things intended. I believe that God, the Bible says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope in a future. And I was wrestling with this idea that we were facing something that was not good. And yet he is. And my faith caused me to fight. It wasn't because I had no faith. But I'm just not the guy that's just going to say, well, it's okay. Oh, God bless it. It's going to all work out. Like, like I'm going to wrestle a little bit. Like, that's what I come from. I like to fight. I don't like to just take it as is. I want to wrestle with it a little bit. And so, so this is what's happening in this book is Luke is writing a book for a guy who is wrestling with his faith. And he sends him on assignment to say, hey, find out, man. Help me to really come to understand that this is real. Because Luke writes in the very beginning of his book that so you, Theophilus, may have certainty of the faith that you have come to know. 
That's what I love about the book is it's for people like me sometimes who struggle often with this idea. Is it right? Is it real? Or I'm being hustled. So anyway, I, 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 we're going to jump in Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Um, again, this is, this is going to be a fun message today, for real. All right, so it says afterward. Now, the afterward is Jesus just healed the guy, remember, who was paralyzed, and they ripped a hole open in the roof, and they laid it. They got his friend down to Jesus. So, right, it's just a really cool opportunity just took place. This is right after, as well, that he called his first disciples, which is quite ironic because he called three third-shift blue-collar fishermen. Okay? Now, keep in mind, back in the day, if you were, a, if you were a, a rabbi, a teacher, you were known by the company that you kept, right? Whoever, how cool your entourage was, was how good you were. And if you didn't have a good entourage, then you weren't looked on very highly. And so Jesus has called three blue-collar, uneducated fishermen to follow him. So it's not the good start. But that's what I love about Jesus. Again, this is why I can trust him, because he works with people that nobody else would choose. And I feel like I fit the mold for that. All right. So he's about to do it again. Afterward, Jesus went out and he looked for a man named Matthew. Pause for a minute. I could preach a whole sermon on that verse I just read to you right there. Listen to what it said. Jesus went out and he was looking. Do you understand? Jesus is intentional. Jesus doesn't do anything by happenstance. He's not just wandering around going, oh, there's somebody. Like when Jesus goes out, he goes out looking. Let me tell you something. You may not realize it, but Jesus has been looking for you a long time. Right? So he's like, oh, I guess I found Jesus. You didn't find nothing. He was never lost. You may become aware of the one who has known you before he puts you inside your mama's womb. But but he's been looking for you a long time. The reason I have been found is because he was looking for me. And some of us, he found us in some gnarly places, right? Come on, we've taken Jesus to some places that we never thought Jesus would go. But he was there with us because the Bible says he is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere with us all at the same time. Like, you think Jesus stayed outside the trap house when you went in. Oh, no. You took him up in there with you. He was with you in the club. He was with you wherever you went. That's who Jesus is. He doesn't leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. That's what Scripture says. Some of you are thinking, man, where I was at last night, I don't know Jesus liked it. (laughs) Maybe not, but he loved you. And he's always there. He never walks out. He never... He never walks away because you're going some places like that. That's not who he is. The Bible says he went looking. He was intentional. I was listening to a podcast, um, a, a business podcast, actually, that was talking about some of the key characteristics of most successful business people. And one of the themes that keeps coming up is intentionality. So let me let me just challenge your thought for a second. Tell me what you're intentional about. What do you do when you wake up in the morning? Do you do on purpose for a purpose? What is it you do with you don't even think about it because it's just in the intentionality of your life moves in that direction. Think about that for a minute. That's not a, a Jesus. Well, maybe. <laughs> but some of us, nope. Right. What is your intentionality? You wake up and you say today is the day that I get to teach my kids about who Jesus is and how he loves them. Today's the day that I get to model what a good man is. As I love the wife or the woman that, they, that, that, that we have created these children together. Today's the day that I get to show my, my, my kids how to respect a man the right way. Teach him, teach them, show them, model these things. Like, what is your intentionality when you get up? Today's the day I get to go to work and I get to take the gospel of Jesus Christ every place I go. Right. Think about it for a minute. Like, what is your intentionality? I love this idea. Could you imagine what would happen if every person in this room who says they believe in Jesus would walk out them doors and live on purpose? Some of us, we just kind of let life happen. And that's what this this whole uh, the podcast I was listening to was talking about. I was like, if that's you, you're missing out on a lot. And so are they. Because it's the people that live on purpose that, that see things. There was a, a quote that I found by Sarah Norman, an NSW, a therapist and coach. Um, here's what she says about intention. She says, it's living in a way that is authentic to my own experience, aspirations and goals, rather than living up to others' expectations. It means living a life aligned with my own values. 
which means you'll have to determine what you value. What do you value? Is that intentional or is it just whatever? Look, let's just be real about it. Most people don't live this way. It's why most people never step into the fullness I think that God has for them. Because they're just trying to survive. Because think about it. Religion has taught us that our whole goal in life is to try and be a good enough person that when it's all said and done, we've done more good than we've done bad and we don't go to hell. Do you understand the purpose of intentionality? See, when I live on purpose, I ain't got time to get distracted by all the dumb stuff because I got a purpose of why I got up today. So when, when, when you know, when fly girl comes away and says, hey, it's like, uh-uh. No, because you are the death of my purpose. I can't have that and have that, and I want that. Plus, I already have this. What more could you ask for? Come on now. So anyway, like that. Anyway, living intentionally is letting go of all the things our minds tells us we need to do in order to prove that we're good enough and then doing the things we would do if we already knew that we were. Oh, that's the gospel right there. Here's the best thing about Jesus, right? Because he loved me. That means when I say yes to Christ, I'm not playing anymore for a win. I play from the win. You understand what I'm talking about? I'm not trying to get anything. I get everything in the very beginning. That is the exchange of salvation. That's where I struggle sometimes, y'all. That sounds too good to be true. Tell me any other place where you go into and they give you the benefits of being a part of that in the beginning and you ain't got to earn it. That'd be like somebody coming to the job tomorrow and saying, I would like the rest of my pay for the next year because I'm going to be your best employee and I'm going to show up every day. So this is how much you're going to pay me this year. Why don't you just give it to me now? (laughs) I must say, I think you're delusional. I think you need, I know people that can help you. Step over here. Right? Like that's going to school. Like some of you going to school tomorrow and saying, "Um, teacher, here's the deal. I'm going to finish high school and it's going to be really good. So I just would like my diploma now, please. Thank you. Ain't nobody do that but Jesus. It's exactly what he does. He says, when I come into Christ, when I say yes to him, I receive the fullness of salvation. Why? Because I will never strive enough to get to where I'm trying to get to. He puts me in that position. And from that place, I live the life that I was intended to live. See, if you're here this morning, bro, and you are striving to try and be a good person, I'm here to give you some great news. Stop it. You don't have to anymore because you already are good. You already are. If you are in Christ, you've said yes to Jesus, received the atoning work he did on the cross, believed in your heart. The Bible says you are right with Christ. Seated in heavenly places. Now, here's the challenge. Stop thinking like the old slave mindset and start understanding who it is that God's called you to be and live from that place takes a minute to turn that around. It may take help. For me, it takes therapy, but I'm in process. So anyway, love the fact that Jesus lived intentional, and I think we should do the same. Now, let's keep going. Um, and that he went looking. So it says here, he says he found him sitting in his tax booth, for he was a tax collector. We got to stop right there. Again, I think sometimes where we struggle is we don't understand what Scripture really means. Like, we, we, we listen to it through our ears, and we say, oh, he kind of worked for the IRS. I don't like those people, but, you know, whatever. No, um, it's a little different back then. Let me give you a historical background of a tax gatherer, right, tax collector. In the time of Jesus, they would be considered a race trader. That's why I called my message today. Uh, wait, let me remind myself what I called it. Hold on. It says, Jesus invites one of those people to be his people. All right. Love it, because I'm one of those people, too. So a tax gatherer in the time of Jesus would be considered a race trader, right? He would be considered somebody who's betraying his own people. Matthew worked for the Roman government. Right? Matthew is this tax collector. He is a Jew. He had Roman soldiers help him shake down his own people to get money. People can relate, you know what I'm saying, where your profession is to take advantage of other people and get rich doing it. That is what Matthew did. So as a tax collector, they were the most hated people in all of Israel or Jerusalem at the time. Um, 
Because here's why. Here's how you got money. You owed me $5, okay? That was your tax. So I came for the five, and I got 10 as well. The five had to go to the Romans. The other five went to my pocket. The more I could shake you down, the more I could hustle you, the more money I made. And I have the full effect of having the Roman soldiers behind me. So if you try to tell me no, I'm going to have them guys handle you. Right? And, and they were fine with it. So literally, this guy hustled his own people for money. Like he ripped them off to try and get rich. So the Jewish people people rightly considered them extortioners because they could keep whatever they overcollected. So no doubt this job, you're going to get rich, but it came with a price. First and foremost, you're going to be hated, right? Um, if you had friends, you'd never know if these were your real friends or these are just your friends because you got some money. You might know what I'm talking about. Like they love you when you got, when you got it, but when you ain't, like who are you? I don't know you. No, you can't stay here. Get out, right? Like, that, that's the situation that he would find himself in. The other thing, there would be some, some societal things that would happen as well. He would be disqualified from ever being a judge or witness in court. He'd be excommunicated from the church. He was not welcome to go into the synagogue. He was kicked out. It's a tax gatherer. You don't belong here. So, obviously, you were going to go to hell. And ultimately... They would disgrace, he'd be a disgrace to his family and most likely disowned. Now indulge my overactive imagination for a minute. I'm not saying this is gospel, I just, this is Chris's. I, I struggle sometimes when I read the Bible because I, I think more about the story. But here was my question I, I came up with this week is, Matthew, what happened to you that caused you to choose this profession? Was you just looking for a come up? Like, were you just looking to make money and get rich? Or have you already been rejected your whole life, and so why not get paid doing it? I mean, what was your story that would cause you to literally become the outcast of society? I guess in the best way you could be an outcast, you were a rich one. And then you and all the other tax collectors, y'all be friends. But nobody else is going to like you. Even your parents aren't going to like you. But maybe they didn't like you to start with. I don't know what it is, but, but I believe there has to be a background and there has to be a story. See, if there's something in life that's changed for me over probably the past five, six years, it's simply this. I don't really judge people as much anymore because when I get to know somebody, I often find out some of the craziest people you meet have some of the craziest stories you've ever heard. Everybody's got a story. We've all got reasons why we do what we do to get to where we're trying to get to or try to be whole or try to be normal or try to be okay. It's honestly, the problem often is it's just easier for most people to judge. See, but if you knew my story, you would understand that. I don't really care if you judge me because I've survived much worse than your judgment and criticism. So your judgment means nothing to me, because in the reality of this is, even in my story, I'll still find my people. And we make sense to each other, and that's enough. See, the thing about Jesus is he wouldn't be considered one of your people. Like, he would be, he was a rabbi, he was a teacher, he was a traveling preacher. Now, everybody had heard about Jesus, because Jesus is blowing up and going viral in these moments, right? People are hearing about the miracles and all this kind of stuff. And so for Jesus to go on purpose, looking for Matthew, that had to be a day for him. What was it like as this preacher just comes walking straight to your booth like nobody looked at Matthew right he's the guy you walk by and keep your head down hoping he doesn't notice you because you probably owe him some money or he would just assume you owed him money or he's going to get money from you right you ever walk in you like just don't make eye contact that way they don't look at you they don't notice you and that's not Jesus he comes walking looking straight at him I'm wondering what Matthew's thinking right he's got to be tripping just a little bit like what is this preacher got to do with me <laughs> like Right. And so but here comes Jesus, like laser focused towards Matthew. He's just simply minding his business, ripping people off, not trying to mess with nobody else besides tearing their money. And he heard about Jesus. But here comes Jesus looking for him. 
keep in mind, I'm not sure Matthew really liked the church. I mean, think about it. At least he's ripping them off, honestly. <laughs> At least they know what's coming when it comes to Matthew. <laughs> I've got soldiers, I'm taking your money, and I'm out. The church is doing it. And the church did it at the time. Give us your money. If you give us enough money, we'll put you at a higher standard. We'll give you a better seat in the t- like, like the, the, the church was corrupt in this season. And just like the church is kind of always corrupt because it's made up of people, right? It's why Jesus needs to really be the head of the church and not us. And hopefully one day we can get to that place where he is the head and we follow his leading and we're not making it about us and our own kingdoms. And that's a message just unto myself um, because it's something I have to remind myself consistently because it's easy to get caught up in in a lot of people like looking at you and following you and wonder. We just really need to get back to where, God, you are the head of this and I'm here just to do whatever you tell me to. But at this time, it's not that way. So I'm sure Matthew's not a real big fan of church people because they're hypocrite, right? Like the church leaders at the time, they do the same thing he does. They just, they just don't tell you it's happening. They kind of just they hustle you a little bit, but they do it in a way where it's like, if you're good enough and if you give us enough money. And so I don't know about you, but I'm like, Matthew, I just prefer to be stabbed in the front, right? Like if, you're, if we, we could still be friends if you'll stab me in the front. Stab me in the back, and that's going to be hard. But if you'll stab me in the front, like... Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Um, my therapist would say, Chris, you shouldn't be stabbed anyway. I know I'm working through that violent stuff, but we're not there yet. So anyway, uh, here comes Jesus. He's laser focused, coming to find him. Let's get to that. 27B says here, and Jesus said to him, comes up to his booth. Jesus said to him, be my disciple and follow me. Says that very moment, Matthew got up, left everything behind and followed him. Huh. This is why I don't believe this book is made up. You could write a much better story leaving that out. Something much more compelling, not having him be one of your followers. Like, think about it. Today, right, if we, let's just put Matt in in church. So, so the, the biggest hustler in the community comes in. And pastor comes up and goes, hey, brother, sister, might be a sister, you never know. I want you to be now my associate pastor. How many be like, that sounds like a great idea? (laughs) Nope, you don't have to take a membership class. Nope, you ain't got to go to school. Nope, you don't have to promise me you're going to change your behavior. You're just going to be a part of me, part of what we do here. Welcome. I'm sure my board would be like, "Uh, Pastor, we need to have a conversation. (laughs) How do we know they're not going to steal our money? (laughs) Like, because they got their own money. We don't need their money. They may have to change some things so they either start a jail ministry. But anyway, um. Think about that, but that is exactly what just took place. Jesus literally comes up to the to the one of the most despicable people in town. Everybody hates him, and, and he doesn't say, Matthew, here's the deal. Man, I really need you to just take all that money you've been ripping people off and give it to the poor. I need you to go and, and do some things. Like, I need you, there's a class at the synagogue. I need you to go there for the next six months, and once you get your behavior lined up right, then I'm going to invite you to come and be a part of me. Is that not, though, kind of what we do in church? We can't let you lead yet. We can't let you serve here because we have a reputation to maintain. And we can't let somebody like you get up here because we don't know. And you might make us look bad. Hmm. How different that is from the one we follow who walks up to the most despicable man in town and says, hey, you follow me. You're going to be with me. You're one of my disciples now. Jesus led with belonging. Come and belong. He went up to a man who probably his whole life had been rejected. And his main message was simply this. You belong. You belong to me. Let's go. And it says, immediately, he left it all and said, I'm with you. See, church, if we're really going to reach people far from Christ, this I'm talking to church people now, those who say they believe and and have have made a confession to follow Christ, if we're really going to reach people from Christ, they need to know they belong. As they are, not as you would have them be. It is not our job to clean people up. That's his responsibility. 
It is our job to tell the person who feels like they have no place in some place like this, you belong. You are welcome here. You're our people. If they're good enough for Jesus, if I was good enough for Jesus, then they better be good enough for us. And that better not just be when they walk through those doors. It should be also when you walk out those doors. I understand sometimes we can question why somebody could be so mean or so unkind. But we don't have a right to write them off because you have no idea what God is going to do. He often raises up the thing you would least likely expect to bring out the greatest message that he will bring forth. And so, so my, my, my thought process today is simply this. Man, you belong. He comes up to Matthew and he says, today, Jesus said, I've come to invite you to belong. And after you belong, you will soon become who I always intended you to be. I have come today to offer you a purpose that will fill the longing that all your striving up to this point has never been able to satisfy. He started with belonging. And after he got that in place right, then he said, now you can become. See, some of y'all trying to become something so you feel like you'll fit in or you'll belong. And I'm telling you, Jesus doesn't lead that way. He says, come belong first. Come be a part of this first. Come ride with me because whoever you hang with, you eventually become like. Right? Some of y'all still striving to try and be something that you're never going to be because you still don't feel like you belong. You are loved as a son and daughter of God. And stop right there. When you say yes to Christ, you are invited into the family. And until you do that, you're pursued by the one who loves you, and he will pursue you until there's no opportunity to pursue you anymore. That's who Jesus is. That's the invitation he extends to each and every one of us this morning. Now, here's the thing, Jesus. This, you're not, you're not, not being too smart about this because there's a lot of people following Jesus, and they watch him go up to the guy. And this guy is, I mean, first he calls, like, blue-collar fishermen and you know love Jesus cuss a little but anyway now he's calling a guy who's hated Jesus is not starting out the crew the right way I'm sure people are thinking why would God want somebody like that oh because you don't understand Matthew's got some superpowers yes sir See, because here's the thing, church, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit again, challenge you to think. Sometimes you look at people and your first judgment is, how could God use somebody like that? Of course he could use somebody like that. Matthew is hated. Everybody, nobody likes him. And God needs somebody who's going to be willing to go and preach this gospel and nobody's going to like him. And they'll still preach it anyway. Check. He needs somebody who isn't afraid to get out and hustle and work hard. He knows how to go out and hustle and get money. Now God's going to flip the script and use him to go get souls. Check. He needs somebody who's determined. Whether they love him or they don't, he's going to push forward. He's going to keep doing it. And that is the man that God calls. See, so let me ask you a question this morning. What are the superpowers that maybe you never knew were superpowers, but in the hands of the right person, that, that script flips, and God can use the thing that you think has been a weakness in your life or it has been something that's unhealthy in your life. Do you understand God often takes those things, turns them around, and uses them for his good and his glory? Some of y'all feel like you ain't got nothing. I'm telling you, you're probably better than you think. For real. I've seen God do it in my life, man. I like to fight. I like to like to go at it with people. I don't fight people now. I fight for them. I don't, I don't quit. Tenacious. Dog with a bone. Not going to stop. Tell me I can't. That's all I needed. Right? Back in the day, it wasn't good. Today, it's real good. Because the people that everybody else will write off, I won't. That was already birthed in me. On the playground. <laughs> Not in church. <laughs> right? In church, we're easy to let people walk. Like, that's different now. I, 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 I'm a hustler. I used to rip people off all the time. Knew how to say what anybody needed me to say. I still use it. Not for me anymore. For him. It allows me to do things that I never thought I could do, get deals that I never thought I could get. They're not for me. 
They allow me then to help people that I never thought I'd be able to help. So you think that your stuff, you like, you look, I got I to gotta change all this stuff about me. I don't know you got to change it. I think you just got to put it in the hands of the one who intended you from the very beginning and watch him flip the script and see what he can do with those strengths and those gifts in your life. Because I need more people that are willing to fight for people. Where it isn't about your pride, but it's about them not making it. Like, and you're willing to go to battle for that. People that won't give up. People that will jump in with both fists and say, look, I'm not leaving until we win this thing. Like, that's what God is looking for. That's what he wants to redeem. And so I'm telling you, Matthew was not a mistake. Matthew was on purpose because one day God was going to raise him up. He would first first and foremost, he's going to write the book of Matthew. And that book of Matthew will be the gospel to the Jewish people. The ones that hated and despised him, he will bring the message of Jesus. And then he will go throughout Jerusalem for the next 15, 20 years after Jesus dies and is resurrected and then ascends to heaven. He will preach the gospel throughout Jerusalem. And then he'll go throughout the entire world. And then it gets sketchy. But, but one of uh, many historians believe the end of his life, he'll be staked to the ground. And somebody's going to take a halberd, which is like a sword with an axe. And they'll chop him in half. Because he will not relent on his belief of Jesus and the message that he preaches. And he was qualified by that because he could care less what anybody thought. He was going to preach this thing. There was a day he could care less and he was going to get his. And now there's this day that he doesn't care and he's going to preach this gospel and it's going to go forth. And that's what God does with people like Matthew. He takes the thing that that seemed like this brokenness, the weakness, and he makes it a strength. So again, I ask you this morning, what's your superpower? What is it that you do like nobody else? What is the thing that you're good at? may not be good, but you're good at it. And if you give it to Jesus, what could he do with that? First, he calls you to belong. Then he gives you a purpose. And then let's just finish this up here. He says, Matthew goes in and he says, um, verse 29, says, Matthew wanted to throw a banquet to honor Jesus, a party. Um, Because Matthew's rich. He's got money and he's about to follow Jesus. So he's going to use this money before he goes like a rager. He's going out like a champ. So he invited Jesus to his home for dinner along with many tax collectors and other notable sinners. I love that. These aren't just sinners. These are good sinners. Like, you know these sinners. (laughs) And then it goes on to say, while they were all sitting together at the table, the Jewish religious leaders and experts of the law complained to Jesus' disciples, why would you defile yourselves by eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't Jesus know it's wrong to do that? I told you Jesus likes to fight sometimes, right? (laughs) Jesus overheard their complaining and said, who goes to the doctor for a cure? Those who are well or those who are sick. I'm not come to call the righteous, but to call those who fail to measure up, bring them to repentance. Now, I want to, I got to pause something. First off, I'm not going to get through all of this because I can't. I don't have time. Second, though, I, I need you to understand something because I've never, like I've heard that before. And sometimes it sounds like Jesus is like, you know what? You guys are good. I'm here to help them because they're the messed up ones. I cannot believe for one moment that that's exactly what Jesus was saying. So I dug deeper into that. When he said those who are well, here's what that means actually in the Greek. Those who are whole, complete and unbroken. Who do you think qualifies for that in the conversation he's having right there? Only Jesus is whole. Only Jesus is unbroken. Both the religious leaders and the notable sinners are all broken. Here's what Jesus, I think, is actually saying. I'm not trying to talk to y'all because y'all think you got it together. And I'm not trying to convince a sick person that they're sick or well, uh, yeah, a sick person that they're sick if they don't realize it. I've come for the people that are qualified by understanding that I got nothing to offer. And in exchange for my nothing, this guy will give me everything. They're the ones that are qualified. You're not qualified because you think your goodness, your works, your merit is enough. And I'm not going to even argue with that. I'm just going to come for the people that want it. Because you don't think you need it, so I'm not wasting my time with that. 
right? Like, that's what I see Jesus doing in this moment. He's going, look, I'm not playing with you. I'm not even going to mess with y'all. And they start talking. They start going back and forth with him. And um, the religious leaders, like, they're upset about this. And like I said, we'll get into this a little more next week. But I, I want to touch on some of it because they got a reputation to keep. So they wouldn't even eat with certain people. They wouldn't associate. They wouldn't talk to certain people. And here's this Jesus that everybody loves, and he's talking to people that nobody else would talk. He's at a party of a guy that they wouldn't even talk to. They was kicked out of the church. Who does he think he is? See, this is what I love about Jesus. He could care less of what you think of him. He is going to do what he is called to do, regardless of whether you like it or like it or, or, or think he should do it or not. Right? Because that's who Jesus is. Let me, uh, it brought something up. So the other day I was talking to somebody. You, would, you just wouldn't think this would happen today, right? You think people would be beyond this at this point? Like they wouldn't be this, this dumb? Um, and I'm going to try and do this right and respectfully, but. It's a story. Uh, I was talking to somebody. There was a woman in our church who was going to another church for a group that they offered. And look, let me be honest with you. Our church doesn't have a lot of programs because we do a lot in the community throughout the week. So if you need some programs and we don't have them, if there's a church that's doing them, go. What if I end up in that church? God bless you. If it's a church that loves Jesus and preaches the gospel, I could care less. But anyway, they were going to a church, and there were some programs there, and, and, and it was a program that was really helping her. And so after one of these groups, they went out together, and uh, they were just kind of talking amongst themselves. And a lady asked her, you know, what church do you go to? And she goes, I go to Connection Church. And she went, you go to that church? She's like, yeah. She's like, what's it like going to church with a bunch of drug addicts? I know. I know. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Y'all know we talk about violence, right? Throat punch? <laughs> then I'm like, she's a woman, I can't. How about verbal assassination? I'm a really good at that. Oh, Jesus, let me light her up, please. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I just got pissed off, I'm not gonna lie, man. I was angry, I wanted to hurt somebody. But my, my, my therapist is teaching me, like, to stay in it just a little bit longer and let it run its full course. Because anger is not usually the first real emotion. Second. Whatever, shut up. Like, I like anger. I'm used to it. Um, the longer I, I stayed there, the longer I started to feel sad for her. We're just going to call her for the sake of giving me a bone. Uh, sandpaper underwear lady. Because something has to be not right for her to be so mean. <laughs> what I started to think to myself, and if I get some background, what does this woman believe about herself to feel so unloved and rejected that she must put other people down to make herself feel like she's somebody? To need to compare to others to prove she's better instead of celebrating that there's a place... There's many places everywhere in this city where everybody feels the opportunity to be loved, welcomed, and accepted, no matter what their story is in life. Like, how could she not offer that same grace like Jesus offered to her? At least I hope he did. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping she's saved. She sure thinks she is. And I, you know, you think about it longer and you think, you know, there's probably a reason sandpaper underwear lady that nobody like that comes to your church. Because if you're part of the welcome committee, people don't go places where they don't feel like they're wanted or belong. I'm telling you, man, this stuff, it's hard for me. So let me just clarify what kind of church we are. I wrote this the other day. Connection Church is full of many people who desire to be whole. And because of many of our stories, we have found multiple avenues and often unhealthy behaviors to try and achieve this goal. But yet we choose to believe that in Christ, we can live a better story 
and start the healing process today so that one day on the other side of eternity, the healing and restoration process we are in now will be made complete. It's a church that is real and we're not afraid to admit it because we would much rather Jesus deal with the real us than the pretense of who we think we are. See, I feel bad for Sandpaper Underwear Lady for this reason, because she will live her whole life as a lie, believing that she is good, because she looks down on others to measure herself. When you compare and compete, you will always live in defeat, right? She's going to miss out the goodness that God has for her, because it's easier to look at them. And often, hear me, y'all, if you've ever felt judged before, the reason they judge you is because they don't like them, and they got to find a way to remind themselves how they're better. I, I just come to believe that at the foot of the cross, every person in this room stands level. Ain't one of us above another. In fact, the Bible says if we think we are great, we actually should be more of the servant of all. I believe if she really understood who Jesus was, she would have a whole nother mindset when it came to that. I love that we are a church full of real people. And you should love it too. It's the people that are in recovery and struggle with addiction that I have invited into my life that have caused me to go to therapy that has changed my life. It's changed my preaching. See, because here's what's happened, man. You get around a bunch of hustlers, you've got to come correct because they'll call you on your stuff. That's a blessing for us. Because real, because we're so conditioned, especially those of us who've done it for so many years, we're so conditioned that as soon as we walk through them doors, we become somebody we're not. And this is what I love, is we've created an environment where you can just come as you are. That way Jesus can meet you right where you're at, and he can deal with the real you and not the fake you. So you can walk out the door and pretend like you're all good, but you're not. And I'll tell you, it doesn't mean you're not good because like, oh, Jesus loves you, he's mad at you because you said something stumb like that, sandpaper underwear lady. You're not good because you have no peace in your life. You have no joy. You have no ability to celebrate the things that God celebrates. You have caught yourself up in something. And so, so as I close my service, I'm praying for her and every other person like that. God, I lift them up to you right now. I believe you can bring dead things back to life. How, how hard it must be when we're so close to life but somehow we're still living in death or a death mindset. God, I pray in the name of Jesus for your church, for the people that call on your name, who believe that you are the one true God, that you would reignite our hearts. Would you break my heart for the things that break yours? Would you move my heart for the things that move your heart? Would you remind me of why you came and what you came to do? It must be hard sometimes to live with such brokenness and emptiness. And so, Father, I pray for Sandpaper Underwear Lady right now that you would fill her with your love. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would quicken the words that came out her mouth on this side of eternity. Because the Bible says, when I stand before you, I'll be judged for every idle word that comes out my mouth. And I don't want to see that happen to her. Plus... What an amazing story it could be that you could bring life into the dead place. Father, I pray for every person in this room like me. And, 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 and this is real, God. Let me not become like that because I can do the same on the opposite side. I can become real judgmental of church people. I can become cynical of the church because I've been hurt much by it many times and essentially be insulting the bride that you love. Help me not to get caught up one way or another. Help me to fall so deeply in love with Jesus that all the noise doesn't matter because I'm here on purpose for a purpose. Because you first called me to belong, then you gave me a purpose for my life. And as all of that starts to move forward, then you start that sanctification process of preparing and making me who it is that you have called me to be. Listen, y'all, if you're in this place today and you don't know Jesus, I'm telling you, just like he walked up to Matthew's booth and he said, come and follow me. I have a plan and I have a purpose for your life. That same Jesus walks around today and he says the same message. Now, this isn't, you need some fire insurance, right? And what I mean by that is like, you, you just, you, you accept Jesus in your heart every time just to make sure you're safe. 
Look, all you got to do is once. He's, he does not forget. He, he does not, the Bible says he does not sleep, nor does he slumber. He doesn't take a day off, right? He is vigilant. So once you said it the first time, you're good. And you didn't mess it up because you ain't that good. You ain't big enough to take away what Jesus has done. The Bible says no one could take him from his hand. When you're in the family you're in, like there's no coming out. Now, you may have some old mindsets that you're trying to renew and, and get your mind right, and that, that, that's a process, but that doesn't mean that you get kicked out of the family or you've been disowned, so don't, don't come with that. But if you're in this place and you've never said yes to Jesus, never invited him into your life to be your Lord and Savior, made a confession of faith to believe that he died on a cross and three days later he came out the grave, and this morning with nobody else looking, heads bowed, eyes closed, you want to say, man, Pastor, I'm going to do that. I want to choose to follow Christ. All you got to do is raise your hand and say, that's me, man. Pray for me. If that's you and you mean it, you've never done it before. That's the greatest decision you'll ever make. It's simple. It's just saying, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you that while I was still far from you, you were coming after me. Right now, I invite you into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of all the wrong things I've ever done in my life. I choose this morning to make you the Lord, Savior, the boss of my life. That's not going to be easy because I have a hard time trusting authority. But with your help, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into this belonging. I'm going to be a part of this family. And little by little, I'm going to choose and I'm going to learn how to live this out to the full expression that you have for me. I'm going to chase after the purpose. I know you got a purpose for me, God. I'm going to give you my superpowers today. I might have used them for a lot of evil at one point, but now you get them. And I believe you're going to redeem them for some good stuff. I'm telling you all, if you said that prayer and you meant it, the Bible says that he has come into your life and he has become your savior. He's your Lord. And it ain't easy. It's, a, it's, it's like anything in life. It's a new life. We're learning to live it. The best thing you can do is get your eyes on Jesus and follow him. If you need some help with that, there's people here at this church. We love to work with you, walk with you. Anything we can do to support you, we'll do it. Man, God bless you guys so much. Thank you for coming out. Appreciate y'all having Easter with us today. Um, do me a favor. Like, when we walk out, right, Come on, let's let every day be Easter. And I'm not trying to be cliche about that, but like, like what if we lived our life on purpose when we walk out? Those of you who believe in Jesus, you call on his name, like, come on, go to the places where people feel like they don't belong, they're not wanted, they wouldn't be accepted, God wouldn't love somebody like them, and take another message. The same Jesus that called you and loves you is offering that same hope to them. Be his ambassador. Speak that truth. Let them know they are wanted. They belong. I appreciate all y'all. Next week, I'm going to get deeper into this. He goes into this idea of pouring old wine, new wine skins. Here's the thing that I love about Jesus, and I want y'all to come back if you can or get it online. Um, Jesus doesn't just call me to leave my old life, sin patterns, and all that kind of stuff. He actually, more than most importantly, I believe, he calls me to a whole new way of thinking. Right? And some of you, the issue in your life is you're trying to think the way you used to think, and it doesn't fit anymore. He gets into it at the end of this chapter where he goes, he goes, you can't take a, a new piece of cloth and use it to patch an old garment because when you wash it, it's going to rip away. Like some of y'all wearing some old clothes and you keep trying to put them on. You're like, these are uncomfortable now. Like I was a good sinner. What happened to me? You're trying to think an old way of thinking and the Holy Spirit's going, that don't fit you no more. It's time to let that go. What we're going to talk about next week is just becoming conscious of how God wants to change our thought process so we can live. Because when we get our thought right, we get our actions right. Too many times we try to do that first before we learn how to think and renew our mind. And so I'm going to have a fun time with that next week. So hopefully you can join us. God bless y'all, man. Y'all have a good week.